Welcome to Inside Cottonwood. I'm your host, Doug Bartosh, also your city manager here in Cottonwood. And um, first off, I thought it, it might be nice to cover uh, last month we did a uh, kind of a special piece on our new public safety communication center. And I just want to report that uh, that uh, new center opened up very successfully uh, during the night of uh, December 1st. And a little after midnight, they, they opened up and uh, they're operating very successfully. So uh, th thanks to all our citizens for uh, your support on that. What was also interesting is right before it opened up, uh, we had a uh, earthquake uh, up in uh, Sedona, uh, just a little above Sedona and it kind of rattled the uh, valley a little bit. I know I was sitting in bed watching television and felt the, um, the bed shake a little bit, and I knew it wasn't me. So, um, and what was interesting is uh, to almost 24 hours previous, there was another earthquake in that same location. It was about a three point something, and uh, probably many of us didn't even feel it. But uh, it, it kind of brought up the uh, issue of emergency preparedness. Um, not only for earthquakes, but uh, the more likely disasters that we would face here in uh, Cottonwood, such as floods, probably top of the list, and then uh, maybe wildfires. So what I did is I, I asked our fire chief, Mike Kirkendall, to come in, because he's also our designated emergency preparedness coordinator. So uh, welcome, Mike, and uh, uh, tell us what your role is as the emergency preparedness coordinator. I mean, what do you do for the city and our citizens? Well, thank you. Uh, glad to be here today. Uh, as the emergency management coordinator or whatever, the, there's multiple different titles that kind of come down that way. Um, my job is to make sure that the city is prepared for disasters, to make sure that our disaster plans or our emergency operations plans are, are uh, kept up to current, uh, make sure that we have an EOC, which is the Emergency Operations Center, which we do have. In fact, we've, we've been fortunate that the Emergency Operations Center for the City of Cottonwood is at the Public Safety Building in our multi-purpose room, and uh, we've been uh, over the last few years able to upgrade some of our AV equipment to really make it a state-of-the-art uh, emergency operations center. Uh, and in fact, uh, while it hasn't been officially activated, we came close to that just a few months ago when we had the, the heavy rains. We actually had our IT people come in and, and set up and be ready just as if we were ready to, to, uh, to actually uh, activate the center. Fortunately, the rains kind of skirted us and we kind of dodged some of the bullet, even though a number of our businesses were flooded in that. So again, overall coordination of, of uh, emergency management and emergency preparedness is, is really falls under the auspices of the uh, fire chief in Cottonwood. Yeah, and I think um, there was one other time when we had it staffed, ready to open it up uh, again because of rains and uh, fortunately it, it didn't hit. But um, I think it is important that citizens know that, that we do have a plan, we do have a, a very well stocked um, emergency operations center where we can coordinate services if we need to. Um, but uh, as you said, fortunately, we haven't had to open that center yet. That's so, the best case scenario is actually is that we don't have to open it because when we do, it means obviously that there's been a great deal of loss, either by flood, fire, or earthquake, as we just found the other day. It certainly could have been if it had been uh, much stronger. We certainly could have sustained damage. You know, and, and um, maybe a lot of people don't understand this, but, um, you know, when you go from a, a three to a four, uh, each point you move up, it, it makes the earthquake ten times greater. So each one of those points is pretty significant in terms of uh, severity of the earthquake. It certainly is, and it, uh, that was a 4.7, and it, it woke me up. And so if we had been a 5.0 or, or greater, we probably would have sustained uh, at least noticeable damage. So, Mike, talk a little bit about, um, because really ever since 
um, the disaster of 9-11. There's been a lot of work, uh, not only at the local level, but at the county, state, federal levels to make sure that the country is prepared for uh, response to disasters. And uh, I know the fire departments are, are very much involved in that, particularly as it relates to large wildland fires. Um, talk a little bit how that hierarchy of preparedness kind of extends down from the federal government. Absolutely. With, and, and pre 9-11, while we certainly had a emergency response framework, 9-11 uh, uh, brought a complete overhaul of what you, we call the emergency response uh, framework that starts with the federal government. Included in that is a real push to have uh, incident management that ties together all the way from the federal level all the way to the local level. We use the uh, NIMS system, it's the National Interagency Management or, or Incident Management System, I'm sorry. And with that, whether we're, uh, whether it's the federal government comes in because it's a large disaster or whether it's something we're just working on at the local level, we set up and establish our command structure the same way. Consequently, when we have an incident, all incidents start locally and they grow from there and they become then, if, if it's a municipal incident in the city, if it grows to a point, it's gonna involve the county and then of course up to the state. And then at some point, if it gets big enough, then the federal government comes in. And this, this incident management system and this framework and, and the training that goes with it is to be able to tie all of these groups together in other words, where we start, we establish the same command system and, and the, how we establish the, the incident management system for a small incident. As it grows, uh, we don't have to, to re-establish an incident management system. We just add to it, we build upon it, bring in the people and continue to, to build this, this system uh, to handle any incident of any size. Um, consequently, Within our city, we have our disaster response guides and plans, and in fact, these are going to be updated this year, and the change in name will be the emergency operations plan for our municipality, but it ties into the county plan. In fact, through an agreement with the county, we adopt a plan. Uh, while it's local for us, it also ties exactly into the county plan and, and, and then into the state plan uh, for these plans and guides, which as you can see, this book is pretty thick. It has different guides for all kinds of things, earthquake, wildfire, and that. And it gives us the, the uh, what we need to do within the, the immediate beginning of the incident, and then as, the, as it evolves, where we go from there. Um, I could continue on for a long time on that if, if we want to, but, but I guess what I'm trying, in, in Back to how this whole system works together, uh, if we had a, a, a incident in our community that, that was bigger than what we could handle, let's say a flood situation where, we, where it went well beyond what we just had here recently, um, our mayor would then declare a disaster, a local disaster, and send that up through the county emergency management, then it goes to the state. Then the state, the governor there can declare a disaster and if it exceeds what they believe the state will be able to help us with then they send it up to the president and seeking to be declared as a national disaster and that is especially important in funding and in recovery for those uh, residences and businesses who have lost because of something uh, it's important that we we follow this system and that these disasters get declared and, and done the proper way uh, not just to get the assistance immediately, but you really have to, to follow this to, to get the recovery dollars that it takes to, to bring us back, as we saw so, so many years ago with Katrina and some of the other things. Um, the disaster is expensive, but the recovery is even right. more expensive than the disaster. You know, and that's what I was th thinking about is, is other than, you know, a, like a, a hurricane, um, maybe a, a large storm, you, you never really anticipate a disaster. I mean, it, you know, so it, it really is true that it seems like you really got to depend on your local response uh, to at least initially deal with that disaster and then certainly have a process that uh, allows for more and more resources to be brought in at different levels of government. 
So it seems like we're well prepared for that. We're certainly as, as prepared, I, I believe, as, as we can be, because you never know what's going to come at you. You know, the earthquake the other night, case in point, you know, we haven't had to deal with that much. We're not known for a, a being in an earthquake zone. On the other hand, floods happen pretty regular with us here. Um, we haven't had a real major, major flood since about 93 that, that did substantial damage, but there have been a number of flood incidences declared disasters within Arizona. Uh, you can go on a, on a site, and I didn't print it, but it, uh, it gives the number of disasters. It's surprising how many times we have disasters that become national disasters that we don't even think about in Cottonwood, but they're happening around Arizona. The floods have just happened in Phoenix, mm -hmm. and those get declared as, as disasters. And um, uh, but all of these things again fall into this framework, and that's uh, and we're uh, a part of that framework. Let's go ahead and take our first break and uh, come back and join us and learn what you need to do to make sure you're prepared for a disaster. At Gettles High Desert Mechanical, rather than do lots of things, we focus on doing one thing right. We serve climate challenged people. Gettles starts with a free system evaluation to identify the best AC and heating equipment for your home or business. Professional installation, warranties, and service after the sale. If you're climate challenged, then we're the right choice. Gettles High Desert Mechanical, the name to trust. Welcome back to Inside Cottonwood. I'm your host, Doug Bartosh, and I'm here with uh, our fire chief, Mike Kirkendall, uh, who's also our emergency manager uh, for the city. And uh, we're talking about, uh, one, how the city's prepared for emergency management uh, and emergency response or disaster response, but also uh, talking about what you can do personally to make sure you're prepared. You know, and another thing I think I'd like to mention, Mike, is is I know we talked about the 9-11 disaster and, and the, you know, the recommendations that came out of that related to preparedness. And I know one of them was integrated or interoperable communication between public safety. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the the really significant things that Cottonwood has done now is we've now developed a, a communications um, network, a, a communications facility that allows all our public safety services to communicate over the air. And uh, I think that's huge and uh, hopefully we can, we can uh, get more public safety services to join us in that uh, facility to coordinate our, our response even better. So. Uh, Good work to everybody who who participated on that, in that and got involved. Even our surrounding partners who participated in putting that uh, project together. Thank you so much. With that, let's uh, let me turn to Mike and say, you know, okay, I'm a I'm a homeowner in the city of Cottonwood. Um, you know, I'm kind of near the river, but not in a, a flood zone. Um, what are the things I need to be thinking about and? What are the things that I need to do to prepare? Well, first I'd like to, one of the, the biggest uh, problems, I guess I would say, is people are just not preparing. Uh, Delphi University out of New York uh, did a study uh, in 2012. I actually did a, a poll and found a few items that I, I, I find that are kind of disconcerting if you really think about it. Um, regarding emergency preparedness, and this is of, of citizens, and, and uh, they found that uh, nearly half of the U.S. adults don't have the resources in place in, in the event of emergency. In fact, 
Uh, one of the things I found, only 44% of people don't even have a first aid kit in their home. 48% do not have emergency supplies. 52% uh, do not have a designated meeting place in the place of a disaster. And you don't think about that one so much, but if something happened and and your, your home had damage to it, does your family have a place that you would all go to and do it, especially if communications was interrupted? Is there a place where you would say, you know, if something happens and we can't get to our house or we're cut off or otherwise, we're going to go to aunt so-and-so's house or whoever's house it is, but at least the whole family knows where to go and consequently uh, take out to having to search for, for those who might be missing. Um, Information, that's one of the things that people tend to not uh, keep the information they need if they were, if they had to, uh, in the case of a, a disaster emergency, 50% uh, of people don't have their medical histories. 49% uh, don't have their doctor's contact information. 44% uh, don't have contact information for additional family members. These are, again, um, you can't count on your cell phone in a disaster. It's, it's, it's something that, that uh, when we have an, a disaster, so frequently the, the cell towers and the whole cell system becomes overloaded very, very quickly. And that's one of the things that comes out of, of, of uh, when they talk to people have disaster, they think, well, I, I got on my cell phone, but I couldn't get a hold of anybody. It wouldn't work. That's because just too many people were trying to trying at the to same time. It. Yeah, that's a good um, point. Uh, crucial documents. It's so important. Everything we have, if you think about it, uh, birth records and marriage records and things like that, that, that perhaps Joe, if you don't have those um, copied and, and at a place that's safe or don't have a last will testament, those kind of things, uh, these are all things that they found that, that we just are underprepared as a nation for disasters. Fortunately, um, there are places to obtain a lot of information. In this day, the information age that we live in, uh, while I brought a few things that you know are out there and we've had forever, books, you know, this here's a preparedness guide saying, are you ready? And, and we use this and we've, we've had these and, and distributed them in different places and taught from them and there's other guides. In fact, I brought you one here from the, the uh, about earthquakes, how to, pre how to prepare and survive an earthquake and we have these written resources at the station for those who might want those. But again, in this day of information uh, that's so readily accessible through the internet, uh, the federal government has put together a program. They've always had some, but they're, the program that's current with them is called is ready.gov. If you go to the ready.gov website, you'll find that the, the page that comes up that's on the screen for the people watching at home now the, their entry screen with ready.gov, it just, it opens up a whole um, cornucopia, if you will, of information that people can have uh, to pull it up over at the, there's on the, on one side of it, it's about knowing your risks and, and you can pull those up and, and look at uh, uh, what are your risks for wildfire and that, and not particularly your risk locally, but what are the risks to you and those things that you need to do to prepare. And if you, if you just simply point and click on these things, information comes up and you can print um, guides and such that you don't even have to uh, uh, leave your home to have all of this information. Uh, down at the, the one in, at uh, the left, if you will, lower corner of that uh, original page, it had publications and you can simply click on the publications page and uh, any person in the United States without charge can order these publications and they'll be sent to them. You just have to follow the, follow it, uh, you know, on the computer and, and follow the links and you can have the information sent to you. One of the things that's on this site and I'd like to talk a little bit about was uh, building a kit and there was a there's a, a place at the top where it says build a kit and you just click on that and it's got then under there you have a place with basic disaster supplies and and what we should have I won't belabor this because I think people should go to that but one of the things is people should be prepared for 72 hours 
That's what they say, a minimum of 72 hours. In fact, they encourage you to be prepared for much more than that, but with 72 hours, you're looking at one gallon of water per day for at least three days, uh, for, for 72 hours. So you need to have a gallon of water uh, accessible. You need per, to have a three-day supply per of food. Per person? Per person, I'm sorry, per person per day, okay. yes. Uh, food, a three-day supply of, of food, for, again, for each person. Uh, you should have a, a battery or crank, a hand crank radio that has the ability to get the weather radio station, the NOAA weather site. And those, those radios are readily accessible through a number of different suppliers. A flashlight, makes sense, most of us have it, but do you have extra batteries? The first aid kit. A whistle to signal for help. You don't think about that, but it should you have a collapse in your home and you were, were trapped <clears throat> or, or something where you needed to signal for help, should you have that close by in a nightstand or something there? Uh, dusk mask, to, to moist towelettes. I, I won't go through everything there. Uh, and of course, I think one of the things that people uh, forget more than other things is you need to make sure you have uh, a supply of your medicines because the ability to, to refill prescriptions will be greatly curtailed in an emergency. And then last but not least, I think one that, that's been brought to my attention by more than one person is, while you take care of yourself, if you have pets, they need 72 hours of food, water, and otherwise. So uh, a lot of information there uh, on the, the this government, uh, free government website, ready.gov. Ready.gov. Let's go ahead and take another break, and then we'll come back and, and talk a, a little bit about uh, kind of emergency preparedness through the holiday seasons. At Gettles High Desert Mechanical, rather than do lots of things, we focus on doing one thing right. We serve climate challenge people. Gettles starts with a free system evaluation to identify the best AC and heating equipment for your home or business professional installation, warranties, and service after the sale. If you're climate challenged, then we're the right choice. Gettles High Desert Mechanical, the name to trust. Welcome back to Inside Cottonwood. I'm your host, Doug Bartosh, and I'm here with uh, Mike Kar Kirkendall, and we're talking about uh, disaster management, disaster preparedness. And, um, you know, w one of the things that uh, Mike and I were talking during the break and that really hit me in terms of your comments is how much we rely on our technology. I mean, particularly younger people today, I mean, they live and die by by their cell phones. and. Uh, you know, to think that those <laughs> will be there during a disaster is is probably, um, you know, a little bit foolish because mm -hmm. they probably won't be. And as you said, even if they are, they're gonna be so jammed up that, you know, uh, you're not gonna be able to get through in terms of phone calls, you're not gonna be able to text, um, you know, and you're probably not gonna be able to get on the internet. So. Um, you know, I don't even know where you find it today. I, I guess you could probably find a, a like a regular radio because I know everybody tends to listen to music on their, or even the news. On the, their, the emergency broadcasting system, that's, it is important to still have radio. Radio is, is, is vital still to people to have that. I think people maybe uh, don't rely as much as they did, but in an emergency <clears throat> radio, uh, the emergency broadcasting system, they still test and, and do that. Most radio stations uh, carry that. That's where most of the information will be coming is over the air. You won't be able to get it on your phone. You know, so it seems like the bottom line is think of those things that are critical to your survival. I, certainly, um, you know, water. I mean, if uh, particularly if in an earthquake, our, our water lines are, are buried underground, uh, they could break, uh, service could be disrupted for several days. I mean, that's something to think about. Um, electricity, 
um, your ability to survive without, uh, you know, without cooling or heating, mm -hmm. uh, without lights, those kind of things. And, and like you said, uh, basic um, first aid kit seems, seems very important in case somebody is injured. Um, certainly, uh, our fire department is, is going to be overwhelmed if it's a, an event that creates a lot of injury and you're going to end up triaging people. I mean, Absolutely. you know, who's the most serious and we're going to deal with them first and so. People will have to be somewhat self-reliant in a, in a major disaster. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, so. So be prepared. I mean, and I think this is something that maybe uh, as a city we can work on a little bit more in in terms of actually getting information out in our water bills to people to uh, on what they need to do to prepare. Yeah, absolutely. You know the uh, the other thing uh, that I talked about is um, we're we're getting we're into the holiday season. Uh, we just finished up uh, with Thanksgiving and now Christmas, and we've got. Uh, beautiful Christmas trees up and lights and gifts and uh, families getting together and driving all over the place. And um, I know as the police departments uh, tend to stay busy through the holidays, I know our fire department stays real busy too. And, and certainly um, while probably not wild, you know, widespread disaster, we do have disasters during the uh, Christmas season or holiday seasons. What's your recommendation to people out there to stay safe? Well, you know, one of the first things is is safety in your own home, and and Christmas trees are are tremendously uh, notorious for starting fires. Um, people, you need to keep your Christmas tree with water if it's a if it's a fresh cut or a, or a live Christmas or it had been a live tree and a cut tree. You need to make sure that it's watered and, and kept watered through the season um, and need to be very careful around it. I, we've, I've, through the years I've been in the fire service, I've been on multiple fires started because of Christmas trees. Um, things are safer than they used to be. Lights are maybe safer than they used to be, but we still have those hazards. Uh, electrical hazards in general, overloading of circuits. Uh, we all love the Christmas lights, but there's a limit to how many strings of lights should be put together and not everybody adheres that and you can overload the system and consequently cause not only uh, to short but to uh, pop a breaker but you could actually overdraw and can cause electrical fires with this uh, cooking uh, there's so many things and certainly what comes to mind in terms of what not to do with your Christmas lights is watch Chevy Chase on Christmas vacation. I mean, <laughs> just watch it the other it's night. Pro probably a firefighter's it, night. Yeah, it really would be. Um, that's Hollywood. Don't try that at home, really. Um, you know, uh, other safety things, of course, this time of year with travel, weather, all of those things. Um, as you can see, the weather changes so quickly here. We are, are just, I think, within weeks away from, from ice and, and some of the things that, that happen, and those will take their toll out on the roads um, uh, and all the other things. And, and uh, while it's more of a law enforcement thing, but we respond to these things, I would ask people to, to show restraint in partying and enjoying the, the, this time of year. We sadly, uh, every year, and, and it seems as though there's accidents caused by people uh, drinking or, or impaired out on the road. And so while uh, it is a season to, to enjoy uh, friends and family, uh, remember that uh, uh, the, the results of, en of enjoying too much can, can be uh, rough on, on your family, uh, those with you and, and others in our community. And, and certainly as a retired cop, uh, you know, everybody needs to understand that there is a, a very strong focus on uh, um, impaired driver enforcement during this time of the year. There's a lot of extra hours that are put in by law enforcement around the state enforcing DUI laws. So it's not worth it, um, again, because it can create a tragedy and just the the fact of getting arrested for driving while impaired it's a very expensive proposition so uh, please don't don't do it find a designated driver or just don't don't consume as much or walk so anything any last uh, 
advice for our uh, uh, viewers that uh, might help them to stay safe through the holiday season? Well, you know, the, uh, there's a lot of cooking. I, 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 Thanksgiving came and went surprisingly. We did not have any fires thanks to the frying of turkeys. That's a dangerous thing too, but we have, we have a lot of cooking and those things, and cooking fires traditionally go up around the holidays, people baking and doing all those things. Just exercise, extra caution during the, during the holiday season. You know, and, it, and again, that's great advice and, and from the law enforcement perspective and even from the fire perspective. You, you know, the holiday seasons can be very stressful. Uh, families get together. Uh, they can get on each other's nerves. Um, it is a high time uh, for domestic violence, domestic disputes. Um, keep it all in perspective. Uh, you know, it's it's a holiday season. It's It's time to be close with family, love family, um, but don't let the stress of the holidays, the hardship of um, spending enough money to make sure everybody get their, gets their presents, don't, don't let that get to you. Um, it should be a happy season where we all love each other and, and enjoy our company. And with that, uh, on behalf of uh, our city staff, um, happy holiday season and uh, for Council uh, Member Pfeiffer in particular, uh, Merry Christmas.